Our speaker today is Sonia Ancoli Israel, PhD, Professor Emeritus and Professor of Research in the Department of Psychiatry uh, at the Center and the Center of Circadian Biology at the UCSD School of Medicine. She received her bachelor's degree from State University of New York, Stony Brook, a master's in psychology from California State University, Long Beach, and a PhD in psychology from UCSF. Dr. Ancoli Israel's uh, expertise in the field of sleep disorders and circadian rhythms, particularly in normal aging and neurodegenerative disease, and in cancer. Her research has included studies on the longitudinal effects of sleep disorders, on aging therapeutic interventions to sleep problems in dementia, and in the relationship between sleep fatigue and circadian rhythms in cancer. Dr. Ancoli Israel is past president of the Sleep Research Society and past president of the Society for Light Treatment and Biological Rhythm, and was on the founding executive board of the National Sleep Foundation. She was honored in 2007 with the National Sleep Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award and the SRS Mary A. Koskadon Outstanding Educator Award. In 2012, with the Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine Distinguished Career Award. In 2014, with the SRS Distinguished Scientist Award. And in 2019, with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine William C. Dement Academic Achievement Award. Dr. Ancoli Israel is published regularly in medical and psychiatric journals with over 525 publications in the field. Our topic today is why does sleep change with age? Dr. Ancoli Israel. Thank you so much, Alvin and, and Dorothy, and thank you all for inviting me. It is really my pleasure to be here to chat with you today. Let me um, get my screen up and going. All right, you should be able to see it. And can you see my arrow or let me get a better pointer on there? Uh, I can see it. Yes, you can see yeah. it. Now you should be able to see the laser pointer. So great. Yeah, so I, I guess I sort of changed the title a little, but, but the idea is the same. We're gonna talk about sleep, how sleep changes with age, and if you have problems sleeping, why and what you can do about it. So I don't know if you wanted disclosures, but I do consult for some companies that certainly won't influence anything I say. So what I'm gonna cover today in the next approximate hour is I'm gonna tell you about how our sleep architecture changes with age, what the consequences of poor sleep are in us older adults, some of the comorbidities that are associated with poor sleep, some of the primary sleep disorders that are very common as we get older, and then what we do to treat them. And I will leave lots of time for questions at the end. So I, I don't know if any of you have heard me speak before. I've been speaking on this topic for almost 40 years. And I always start with this cartoon. Here's uh, Marvin and his grandpa, and they're doing a puzzle and grandpa falls asleep. Marvin says, grandpa fell asleep playing with me. I better put these someplace for safekeeping. And he takes grandpa's glasses. And of course, it's not the glasses I care about here. It's a fact that grandpa fell asleep while playing a game with his grandson, which we would consider a very inappropriate time to fall asleep. Now, people obviously think this is funny. That's why it's a cartoon. But if you don't remember anything else from my talk today, Remember that no matter what your age, falling asleep at these inappropriate times is never normal behavior. So let's look at how much sleep older adults um, get or should get, or what they report getting. There is this myth out there that older adults sleep less than younger adults. These are data from the National Sleep Foundation a nonprofit organization whose mission it is, is to educate the public about sleep. And uh, many years ago, they did uh, yearly surveys about sleep. And what we're looking at here are data from one survey that looked at those aged 18 to 54 
And then a second survey for people 55 and older. They called that older adults. I argued with them at the time that 55 is not older. Now that I fall more into this age group here, I really argue with them that 55 is not old. Nevertheless, this was the breakdown. So what we're looking at here, the blue is age 18 to 54. The pink is 55 to 64. The yellow is 65 to 84. And the orange is this combination of this older, so-called older group. And we're looking at how many hours sleep these people report on weekends, uh, weeknights and weekends. And what you see is on weeknights, the younger adults are sleeping under seven hours a night, but older adults are reporting sleeping a good seven hours. On the weekends, the younger people are trying to make up for all that sleep deprivation during the week. So they report around seven and a half hours. But older adults stay consistent at seven hours of sleep. So why do we think that older adults sleep less? Well, there was this wonderful meta-analysis that was done. It reviewed 65 studies, over 3,500 people from age five to 102. That's quite the age range. And what they found is that sleep actually re remains uh, very constant from age 60 on. It doesn't get worse as we continue to get older, except for sleep efficiency, which decreases. So let's look at slow wave sleep, which is what people kept saying decreases in the older adult and that sleep efficiency. So slow wave sleep is our very deep sleep, like all stages of sleep. It's very important. Uh, we now um, understand that uh, during slow wave sleep, some of the amyloid plaques that contribute to Alzheimer's are sort of cleaned out of our brain. So it's an important stage of sleep. And people thought that it decreased in older adults. But as you see here, it actually starts decreasing in our 30s. And once we hit around 60, it remains fairly stable. So older adults don't have um, any less slow wave sleep than people in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And what about sleep efficiency? Let me define that for you first. Sleep efficiency is the amount of sleep given the amount of time you're in bed. So in the ideal world, that would be 100%, right? You'd be asleep the entire time you're in bed. But of course, it takes everyone at least a few minutes to fall asleep. Everybody wakes up once or twice during the night. So we consider a sleep efficiency of 90% or above to be good sleep efficiency. This is actually 88% but uh, close enough. And what you see is that with age in both men and women, sleep efficiency does decrease. So why is that happening? If people are still reporting sleeping a good seven hours, why is their sleep getting worse? Well, before I answer that question, I'm gonna ask a different question is that, and that is why do we care if older adults have poor sleep? And obviously there are consequences to it. Um, these are, are data and results from many different studies and one study called Mr. Oss and older men. Um, and you can see a large sample size over 3000 older men. Poor sleep quality as, as recorded through a questionnaire was associated with twice the risk of depressive symptoms and three and a half times the risk of developing actual depression. And taking more than an hour to fall asleep at nights so that this is sleep onset latency was associated one and a half times the risk of both depressive symptoms and having a diagnosis of depression. In another study, when that same group of older men, a lower sleep efficiency that is less than 80% and being awake for 90 minutes or more during the night was associated with one and a half times the risk of poor physical function. And in older women, there was a 30 to 40% increased risk of falls associated with sleeping less than seven hours a night or a low sleep efficiency. And we all know the danger of falls in older adults because it often does lead to um, shorter survival. And that short total sleep time and poor sleep efficiency on its own was also associated with a greater risk of mortality. So, and th these are just a few points. So, so poor sleep in the older adult can have serious consequences. Other consequences of disturbed sleep is difficulty sustaining attention, a slower response time. And by response time, 
I don't care about how long it takes you to push a button in response to a stimulus. What I'm talking about here is how long it takes you to slam on the brakes if a child runs in front of your car. And that response time is slower if you're not getting a good night's sleep. Difficulties with memory, concentration, and decreased performance. And as I already mentioned, there's a higher risk of depression, poor physical function, cognitive impairment, falls, and mortality. And the problem is, if you look at all these symptoms, if you went to a doctor and said, I'm having problem with my memory, I'm having problem with attention, that doctor would say, oh, you probably are starting to have dementia. All these symptoms might be misinterpreted as dementia, but in fact, they are not necessarily dementia. They're just a result of not getting a good night's sleep. So why does sleep get worse as we get older? Is it just because we're aging? No, aging on its own does not cause sleep problems. But all the things that happen to us as we get older do contribute to poor sleep. And those include um, more common medical and psychiatric illnesses, all the medications that we take because of all those medical and psychiatric illnesses, changes in our circadian rhythms, our biological clock, and a higher prevalence of primary sleep disorders such as insomnia, sleep apnea, REM behavior disorder, and restless legs or periodic limb movements in sleep. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna touch at least a little bit on each of these bullet points. So let's start with medical conditions. Anything that causes discomfort, particularly at night, is going to be associated with poor sleep, whether it's the pain of headaches or um, neuropathy or arthritis or cancer, whether it's the neurodegenerative processes, uh, um, obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, you can read all this. Nocturia. Nocturia is defined as getting having to get up to go pee two or more times a night. Obviously that's gonna disrupt your sleep. So all these things are associated with disturbed sleep. And notice I say associated with, I don't say cause, because we don't think these are necessarily causal. You can have some poor sleep. And if you have pain in addition, it's gonna make that sleep worse. And these are bi-directional. Poor sleep can lead to more pain, for example, just like pain can lead to poor sleep. So we talk about these conditions as being comorbid, and that has treatment implications, because if something is comorbid, it means you want to treat them at the same time. So if someone has um, the pain of arthritis, you want to treat that pain at the same time as you treat the sleep problem. And what studies have shown is if you treat both concurrently, you get a better result in both you improve both the pain and the sleep when you treat them both together. Um, these are also data from the National Sleep Foundation. This time what we're looking at are those people that had no medical conditions in the blue, one medical condition in the pink, two or three medical conditions in the yellow, or four or more medical conditions in the orange. And what you see is people that reported less than six hours of sleep, tended to have lots of medical conditions. Having any insomnia, the more medical conditions you had, the more insomnia you had. And the same thing, uh, EDS stands for excessive daytime sleepiness, the same kind of thing. So multiple medical conditions are associated with poor sleep. So that's one reason why older adults have lost the ability to get the sleep that they need. We still need the same amount of hours. And I think I neglected to tell you how many hours that is. So older adults, just like younger adults, need seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, and, and that is genetically determined. We need seven to eight hours of sleep. And that need is there even when you're older, but the ability to get the seven to eight hours is decreased. And one of the reasons is because of all these medical and psychiatric illnesses. Another reason we've lost that ability to get lots of good sleep is because of all the drugs we take. So here's Marvin again. Marvin's talking to his little cousin. And he says, how come grandpa never goes to a job like other big people? Because he works at home, silly. See, he runs a drugstore. I know you're all muted and I can't hear you laughing, but I know you're all laughing back there. Um, 
we take a lot of medications, often more than we need. And many of these medications are also associated with poor sleep. I have with insomnia here, but it's poor sleep in general. Let's start with alcohol, not a prescription drug, but a lot of people will use alcohol to help them go to sleep because alcohol does make you sleepy initially. But several hours later, when the alcohol leaves your bloodstream, it wakes you right back up again. Alcohol causes insomnia. Maybe you drink a few glasses with dinner and you're sleepy initially right after dinner. But then a few hours later, when it's time to go to bed, you're going to be wide awake. So alcohol and sleep do not mix well. Caffeine, we'll talk about caffeine, I think, a little bit later, too. But obviously, you know that caffeine disturbs sleep. In case you're still smoking, here's another reason to stop because nicotine is associated with poor sleep. But let's look at our prescription medication. Antidepressants, corticosteroids, decongestions, beta agonist antagonists, statins, which everyone takes, uh, stimulants, et cetera, et cetera. Pretty much all these drugs can affect sleep. If a drug is stimulating and you take it at night, it's gonna make it harder to sleep. If a drug is sedating and you're taking it during the day, it makes you sleepy during the day, but then you can't sleep at night. And sometimes by just adjusting the dose or the time of day that you take these medications, you can have a tremendous positive impact on sleep. So now we read medical and psychiatric illnesses. We've talked about the polypharmacy. The next topic, the next reason people have lost uh, the ability to get the need that the sleep that they need is changes in our biological clocks. So circadian rhythms are in fact our 24 hour rhythms. Circadian comes from the, uh, the, the Latin circa dia, about a day. So it's about 24 hours. And there are lots of things in our systems that have circadian rhythms. Blood pressure has its own circadian rhythm. Blood pressure dips at night and rises in the morning. Um, many of our hormones, our core body temperature, lots of things have these 24-hour rhythms. And we know now that they're controlled by a central clock in our brain and our uh, suprachiasmatic nucleus. And we also know now that there are multiple other clocks throughout the body, all controlled by this one master clock. So we do go through some normal changes in our circadian rhythms with age. Um, ben Franklin was wise enough to say early to bed, early to rise. He went on to talk about makes a man healthy, wealthy, and rise. But really what he was describing here is what happens to the older person as we get older. Um, you've all seen or maybe experienced being at the opera or the theater and having someone fall asleep. This was actually a picture I cut out. It was some ad. I don't even know what the ad was for, but I thought this is exactly describing what we call um, circadian rhythm changes in the older adult. So let me explain what happens. The typical phase of sleep for most adults is they get sleepy somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock. And that's because that's when our core body temperature is dropping. When core body temperature drops, we get sleepy. When it rises, we wake up. So the typical phase for most adults is they go to sleep somewhere around 10 or 11. They sleep there seven or eight hours. They wake up somewhere six, seven in the morning. But in different times in our life, this pattern shifts. So teenagers, adolescents, young adults have what we call a delayed sleep phase. They don't get sleepy till maybe one, two in the morning. And at that age, they actually need closer to nine hours of sleep. So do the math. If they're not going to sleep till one in the morning, and they need nine hours of sleep, they're gonna wake up around nine or 10. And that is the typical thing that teenagers love to do, right? And as parents, we used to yell at our kids. Well, not me, of course, but many parents would yell at their kids and say, stop being so lazy, stop wasting the whole day away, you know? But this is a very normal sleep pattern for that age group. The problem, of course, is they have to go to high school at 7.30 in the morning, which is like the rest of us trying to sit in a math class at three in the morning, which is why there's this huge movement to start high schools later in the morning. So we call these people owls. Most people who are delayed, first of all, if you're an owl, you know you're an owl, but most people that are delayed as they grow into adulthood, the pattern sh shifts back towards this more typical phase. Some people, however, stay here their whole life. 
it's actually uh, genetically determined in runs of families. And that, that's why we have many adults who are also owls. And as I said, if you're an owl, you know you're an owl and you've been an owl your whole life. But for those people that shift back, as we continue to get older, that circadian rhythm continues to advance so that older adults have what we call an advanced sleep phase. Our core body temperature is dropping earlier in the evening, maybe seven, eight, nine o'clock. And um, if we went to bed at that hour, we would sleep our seven, uh, seven hours. But again, if you do the math, that means we're waking up three, four, five in the morning. What is the biggest complaint that older adults have about their sleep? I'm waking up in the middle of the night. Here it is, the middle of the night, and I can't get back to sleep. And they can't because physiologically speaking, their night is done. Their core body temperature is rising here and their body is ready to wake up. It doesn't matter that the sun hasn't risen yet. Now, there are two scenarios. There are two things that happen here. One is that although people might get sleepy at seven, eight, nine o'clock, and by the way, that's why restaurants have early bird specials, right? We eat dinner earlier, we get tired and go to sleep earlier. All right, so even though they might get sleepy at eight, nine o'clock, they think, oh, it's too early to go to bed. So they stay up later, but they're still waking up at four in the morning. Now they're not in bed long enough to get a full night's sleep. You can't sleep seven to eight hours if you're only in bed for five. So that means they're gonna be tired during the day. They might take a nap somewhere here in the afternoon. That nap allows them to stay alert later into the evening. But now they get into this pattern, this cycle of not sleeping enough at night and needing to nap during the day. The second scenario, which I think is much more common, is people come home, they have dinner, they sit down after dinner to read or watch TV, and what happens? They fall asleep. And they sleep maybe half an hour, maybe an hour. Then they wake up and they get ready for bed. Suddenly, they can't fall asleep. You know, sleep is part of what we call the homeostatic process. You have to be awake a certain amount of time before you're going to be sleepy enough to fall asleep. If you just slept for an hour here in front of the TV, when you get up and try to go back to bed, it's going to be much harder to fall asleep because you haven't been awake long enough to be sleepy enough to go back to sleep. But you still wake up at four or five in the morning. So now these people come in to see uh, sleep doctors like me or their own primary care doctors. And they say, you know, doc, I have horrible insomnia. I have trouble falling asleep. I have trouble staying asleep, but it's not insomnia. It's an advanced sleep phase combined with that bad habit of napping in that early evening. And by the way, when you ask people, do you nap? They'll say no, because it seems that sleeping in front of the TV doesn't count as a nap but it's certainly enough to disrupt your sleep. And so that's the more common scenario. And as I say, this advanced sleep phase is very common. It doesn't mean that the day you turn 65, you're suddenly advanced. It's a gradual process all along the different ages, but eventually we all reach this advanced sleep phase. There are ways to um, shift your rhythm. For owls, we recommend morning light, light, is the strongest cue that our circadian rhythms have that our body has for knowing when to go to sleep and wake up. And light is the best cue for stabilizing or strengthening our circadian rhythms. For someone who is phase delayed, we recommend morning light, which will push the rhythm back so that these owls fall asleep earlier and wake up earlier. Sometimes we combine that with very, very, very low dose melatonin taken in the evening, which also will pull that rhythm in this direction. For the morning larks, for our older adults with advanced sleep phase, we recommend um, evening light. That's why it's a light bulb instead of the sun. The sun isn't always out in the evening, but really what I would tell when I was seeing patients, what I would tell my patients is go out as late in the day as possible when the sun is still out and get that, that evening or late afternoon light exposure. And that helps push the rhythm forward so you can stay alert later into the evening and sleep later into the morning. Um, what do most older adults do when they wake up early in the morning? They go out for an early morning walk, which is great. Exercise is wonderful. But if you do that, you wanna be sure to wear sunglasses 
because morning light, remember, will advance you even more. So if you get morning light here, you're going to get sleepy even earlier and wake up even earlier. And the mechanism of the light affecting our rhythms is through the eyes, so the retinal hypothalamic tract. And so dark glasses will block all that morning light so that you don't advance yourself more and you go back out again late in the afternoon while the sun is still out without sunglasses to help delay your rhythm. I hope that was clear. If not, please save your questions and I'll review it again with you at the end. All right, so now we've talked about medical psychiatric illnesses, polypharmacy, changes in circadian rhythms. The other reason that older adults have lost the ability to get a good night's sleep is because of primary sleep disorders. The more common one is uh, sleep disorder breathing or sleep apnea. I'm sure you've heard of it. Sleep apnea is a condition where people stop breathing in their sleep. If this is your airway, uh, I hope you can all see me, not just the slide, but if this is your airway, when you fall asleep, your airway collapses, you're trying to breathe, uh, but the air can't get in or out. So you wake up, the airway opens, you go back to sleep, the airway closes, and this goes on throughout the night. Now, this is a photograph that I took of a statue of Brahms when I was in Vienna many, many years ago. And I am 99.9% .9 sure Brahms had sleep apnea. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, he's overweight. The more you wait, the greater the risk of having sleep apnea. He's got this big white beard, which is likely covering a double chin and a thick neck. People with sleep apnea tend to have thicker necks and smaller airways. Um, because of that white beard, I can also tell he's older. The older we get, the higher the prevalence of sleep apnea. And he's sound asleep. Who has a statue made of them sound asleep? Excessive daytime sleepiness, falling asleep at inappropriate times is one of the main symptoms of sleep apnea. So I'm pretty sure he had it because he meets all the risk criteria. The other um, symptom of sleep apnea is this loud snoring. We ask our patients, how loud do you snore? Are you heard only in your bedroom? Can you be heard one room away, two room? Are you a three room snore? Can your neighbors hear you? And often they'll say yes, because this is a very, very loud snore um, that these patients have. And um, well, we'll talk about women in a minute. So um, obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, is very common in older adults with close to 60% having at least mild apnea and 25, 26% having moderate to severe apnea. That is much higher, a much higher prevalence than in younger populations. And it particularly goes up in older women with menopause. Seems that estrogen is somewhat protective. So once we go through menopause, the prevalence of apnea goes way up. Um, and it also, the prevalence increases with increasing age. So the older we get, the higher the prevalence uh, of moderate to severe sleep apnea is. Why does it increase in prevalence in older adults? We don't know for sure, but I think this is a very elegant study that was done by my colleague um, at UCSD when he was at Harvard, um, Atul Mohatra. And what he showed is he did, he did MRI of older adults' airways. These were not older adults with apnea, just general older, healthy older adults. And what he found was that the soft palate gets longer as we age, the pharyngeal fat pads increase in, increase in size, the shape of the bony structures around the airway change, and the response of the genioglossal muscle to negative stimulation diminishes. And all those things would contribute to not being able to breathe at night. So that might be one reason why the prevalence of apnea increases with age. So is sleep apnea pathological? If it's so common, is it pathological? Well, most studies suggest that sleep apnea doesn't increase the risk of mortality in the older adult where it does in the younger adult. But these studies also suggest that older adults with apnea are excessively sleepy during the day, that apnea contributes to decreased quality of life, greater risk of nocturia, so getting up to pee too often at night, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and decreased cognitive function. In fact, we now know that sleep apnea increases the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So yes, sleep apnea is pathological and should be treated no matter the age of the patient. 
The um, gold standard treatment is something called PAP, positive airway pressure. Uh, it's a mask that connected via a hose to a machine which push, pushes positive pressure through the airway, which acts as a splint to keep the airway open during the night. As I say, this is our gold standard, but there are other treatments as well for mild, uh, sometimes even moderate sleep apnea. You could get um, oral appliance, which pulls the jaw forward. And by pulling the jaw forward at night, it enlarges the airway. There are devices that you um, put on your nose that enlarge the airway. Surgery is an option we never ever recommend it. It's not that successful. Um, so it's, uh, Although it's still done, it's not something that most of us would recommend. There are better treatments around for sleep apnea. And if you have questions about some of these treatments and other treatments, we can talk about, about that later too. Another very common sleep disorder, which makes it harder for us to get the sleep that we need, is called REM behavior disorder. So here's um, this gentleman, and he says, I dreamt I was driving down a mountain road and the brakes failed, and he pushed out a piece of his bed. REM behavior disorder is, so let me back up. During REM, rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep is our dream sleep. And during our REM sleep, we're supposed to be paralyzed, which keeps us from acting out our dreams, from doing exactly this kind of thing. Or if you're dreaming that you're playing tennis, this is what keeps you from swinging your arm and hurting yourself or your bed partner. People with REM behavior disorder have lost that atonia during REM sleep. So let me read you this one um, case example. A 60 year old surgeon began to punch and kick his wife, sorry, and jump out of bed during nightmares of being attacked by criminals, terrorists, and monsters who always tried to kill me. Work-related stress was the presumed cause of a sleep disturbance, but the violent behaviors intensified despite retirement three years later. He sustained several head lacerations and his wife once had a severe headache for two days after receiving an accidental blow to the ear. The proper diagnosis was established after 11 years. Can you imagine 11 years? And a prodrome of excessive limb and body jerking during sleep had been present for 33 years. That's a long time to go without being diagnosed. So this is an example of what REM behavior is like. It is treatable. Do I have this? Yeah, I wasn't really going to talk about drugs, but it is treatable. There are medications that can treat it. There are behavioral managements, um, removing dangerous objects from the environment, maybe putting the mattress on the floor so the person can't fall out of bed, sleeping in separate beds so that your, your bed partner doesn't get hurt. We now know actually that uh, REM behavior disorder at a younger age is often indicative of um, the person having a greater risk of developing Parkinson's disease later on. So um, it is a disorder that needs to be diagnosed and treated. Um, it's much more common in the older adult than the younger adult. And it's another reason why older people have a harder time getting the sleep that they need. All right, here's another cartoon. It says, you look worried, Pete. Pierce. Pet troubles? Don't tell me your rat is back in the hospital. No, no, he's fine. The tail transplant was a total success. Great. So what's the, my centipede has restless leg syndrome. Restless legs is a condition where people can't sit still and they, um, it's like they have pins and needles in their legs and they have to constantly be moving their legs. That's why if you have a centipede with restless legs, it's funny. The prevalence of restless legs also increases with age. Each color here is another study, and you can see pretty much in every single one, um, the prevalence of having this condition increases as we get older. How do you know if you have restless legs? Well, if you have it, you know. You know because you can't sit still. You can't sit still in, a, in an airplane. You can't sit still at the movies or sitting on the couch. You're constantly, you can't see me, but I'm shaking my legs. You're constantly shaking your legs or getting up and having to pace. The way we know if you have it is we ask you these four questions and you have to answer yes to all four for the diagnosis. Do you have or have you sometimes experienced recurrent uncomfortable feelings or sensations in your legs while sitting or lying down? Do you have or have you experienced a recurrent need or urge to move your legs while sitting or lying down? 
Do these uncomfortable feelings or sensations or the need to urge disappear or improve when you're active or moving around? And are these uncomfortable feelings worse in the evening or at night compared to the morning? If you answered yes to all four, then you likely do have restless legs. And again, you, you should see your doctor if you haven't already and get it treated. Again, I don't wanna talk about medications, but there are medications that can be used to treat this very, very uncomfortable disorder. And I, I should add, before I go on to insomnia, there's a related disorder called periodic limb movements in sleep, where people kick or jerk their legs every 20 to 40 seconds for periods throughout the night. Not everyone with restless legs has periodic limb movements and not everyone with periodic limb movements has restless legs, but they are associated with you each with each other. And often that kicking at night might also disturb your sleep. It might also disturb the sleep of your bed partner if you're kicking the partner all night long. All right, the other very common sleep disorder is insomnia. Hopefully when you see your doctor, this is not what your doctor says. I wouldn't lose any sleep over it, kiddo. How common is insomnia? Um, these are old data, but they still hold up. Um, in the older adults, about 25% of older adults have insomnia, and you see the prevalence increases with age. Um, in another study, what we found uh, was that looking just at almost 10,000 older adults, the prevalence of insomnia complaints was 57%. About a third of these people had complaints, but it wasn't chronic, and only 12% had absolutely no sleep complaints. But this 57% is very interesting because these chronic sleep disturbances were primarily associated with poor health. So as I said before, it's that increase uh, in all the medical and psychiatric problems that we have that contributes to poor sleep. And in this, in this study, 2,000 of the people who had chronic insomnia were followed up a couple years later, and 50% of them no longer had sleep problems. And their improved sleep was associated with improved health. And Foley, the um, senior author on this study, concluded that these data do not support a model of incident insomnia caused by the aging process per se. That's the most important phrase there, and that's what I said earlier. It is not aging that causes our poor sleep. It's all the other things that happen to us as we get older. So what about insomnia? What, what's happening when we have insomnia? I'm going to walk you through. I know this looks complicated, but it really isn't. And I'm going to walk you through it. Our sleep is determined by these two processes, what we call the homeostatic process or the, the sleep drive, that need to sleep, and the circadian process, that 24-hour rhythm process. So the sleep drive, this need to sleep, when you first wake up in the morning, is very low because you just slept. But as we are awake throughout the day, the longer we're awake, the more that need to sleep or that sleep drive increases. Until you get to a point where that need to sleep is so great you can't stay awake anymore, you fall asleep. And once you're asleep, of course, that need to sleep dissipates until the next morning when the whole thing starts again. What keeps you from falling asleep as that sleep need is increasing throughout the day? It's a circadian alerting system. It also starts very low in the morning and increases throughout the day to help you stay awake. Until we get to this balance point, which is when you actually fall asleep, and then that also decreases until the next morning when the whole thing starts again. You see two other curves here. This is our core body temperature curve. Remember I told you core body temperature drops at night, that's when we get sleepy, rises in the morning, that's when we wake up. But notice core body temperature takes a dip in the early afternoon. That's why we get sleepy after lunch. It is not necessarily because you ate a big meal, it's because it, physiologically speaking, it's a very normal time to want to sleep. And in fact, there are whole cultures that do that, less so than they used to be, they're all changing. But um, the siesta was quite common all over the world where people took that afternoon nap. But if you look at those cultures, you find that people who would take siestas 
would have dinner and go to bed at night much later than we did. So in a 24 hour period, they were getting the same amount of sleep we were. They were just doing it in two bouts when in our culture, we tend to do it in one bout. And this last curve is our melatonin curve. Um, I'm not talking about the melatonin you buy over the counter. This is endogenous melatonin secreted in the pineal gland in our brain. And melatonin is secreted in darkness. We call it our hormone of darkness. And it helps us in the whole sleep process. And so that's why we see our melatonin. We'll come back to this darkness issue in a few minutes. But it's when these two systems get out of whack that we start having difficulty sleeping. And so this is what then leads to insomnia. We call this Spielman's 3P model. You start out with predisposing factors. Perhaps you're anxious about something or you're depressed. Um, you're worrying and stressing, particularly about sleep. Oh my God, I know I'm not gonna be able to sleep tonight. Or you have that decreased homeostatic sleep drive. That need to sleep, that homeostatic process isn't strong enough to help you fall asleep at night. But that on its own will not cause insomnia, will not result in insomnia. You need to have these precipitating factors, things we talked about, medical problems, um, medications, shift work will do it, or just having something stressful in your life. And a stress doesn't have to be a bad stress. Your grandchild is getting married. That's a good stress, but it might still be a stress. Um, but even then, you won't necessarily have chronic insomnia. It's this, these perpetuating factors that make the insomnia chronic. And these are often the things that we do to try to make our insomnia better that actually make it worse. And when we treat insomnia, what we're trying to do is break these associations. We try to change these perpetuating factors, all those things that you're doing that are actually making it worse to try to make sleep better. We call this cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. It is the most effective treatment that we have, more effective than any medication and more long lasting. And it can be broken down to four main steps. These I would say are the four cardinal rules of good sleep, good sleep in general, even if you don't have insomnia. The first rule is don't spend too much time in bed. The more time we spend in bed, the more fragmented and disturbed our sleep becomes. So if you wanna sleep eight hours, you shouldn't be in bed more than about eight and a half hours. What does the insomnia patient do? Ugh, I didn't sleep a wink last night. I'm gonna to go to bed two hours earlier to try to get more sleep. By extending that time in bed, they're actually making their sleep worse. So you don't want to spend too much time in bed. You want your time in bed to be close to the amount of hours you want to be asleep. Rule number two, get up at the same time every day, no matter how much or how little you slept the night before. There are a couple of reasons for this, but the most important part is our circadian rhythm needs one stable point around which to fluctuate. You can't control what time you fall asleep. You can only control what time you wake up. So it's important to get up at the same time every day. Rule number three, if you're not sleepy, don't go to bed. It doesn't matter what time the clock says it is. The time for you to go to bed is the time when you think you can fall asleep. What many people do is they go to bed too early. Well, my husband's going to bed or my wife's going to bed, so I should go to bed too, even though I'm not tired yet. If you go to bed when you're not sleepy, what's going to end up happening is you're going to toss and you're going to turn and you're going to get all tense and upset about the fact that you haven't fallen asleep. That is not conducive to good sleep. So if you're not sleepy, you don't go to bed. And the last rule is if you're not asleep, don't stay in bed. That same thing. If you're the second you start getting tense and upset about not being asleep, you get out of bed. You go into another room. You do something that's quiet and calming and and will be more conducive to making you tired. And when you feel your eyes closing, that's when you go back to bed. And lo and behold, if when you go back to bed, you start getting all tense and upset again about not being able to fall asleep, you get out of bed again. And you do that all night long if necessary until you can get into bed and fall asleep. You want to associate the bed with calmness and sleep and not with being tense and anxious and not being able to sleep. And that's what these behavioral um, suggestions will do to help you 
help your brain relearn how to sleep. There are also things that we call sleep hygiene. Just like you have good dental hygiene, we have good sleep hygiene. Um, you want the environment to be as dark as possible. Remember I said melatonin is secreted in darkness. If you have too much light coming in um, to your bedroom, that's going to tell your brain, ah, stop secreting melatonin, it's time to get up. So you want dark, a very dark environment, blackout curtains, uh, eye mask, whatever it is to make it as dark as possible. You want the temperature to be a comfortable temperature. I know that's a lot of arguments between uh, husbands and wives often, but what's comfortable for you will be best. Um, and a quiet, you want it, the environment, of course, to be as quiet as possible. All right, this is one of my favorite slides. We have Mrs. Uh, Bear here and Mr. Bear here, and she says to him, how many times have I told you no coffee after September? Well, what I say is no coffee after lunch. Um, Caffeine will disturb your sleep. I have so many people that tell me I can have uh, two shots of espresso at bedtime and it doesn't bother me. But if I recorded your sleep, I would show you that it does. And caffeine is not just coffee. Green tea has loads of caffeine in it. Sodas have loads of caffeine. And a diet soda has more caffeine in it than the non-diet equivalent. So diet Coke has more caffeine than a regular Coke. So think about what you're ingesting and the timing of that in, uh, of ingesting of the caffeine and try to adjust that if you're having trouble sleeping at night. Exercise is always important. The more physically fit you are, the better you're going to sleep. Um, and in general, exercising about six hours before bedtime is ideal because when you exercise, your core body temperature rises and it takes about six hours for it to start dropping. Remember we said when it starts dropping, you get sleepy. That doesn't always fit into someone's schedule, but in general, the more physically fit you are, um, the better you sleep. And that doesn't mean you have to go run a marathon. It's doing whatever you're capable and able to do for your exercise. Now, this is one of those times that I wish I could hear your answers. When, or maybe someone used, you guys should just unmute it or if you can and, and yell it out. What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the middle of the night? I want one person, yell it out. Alvin, go ahead. <laughs> go to the bathroom. Right, go to the bathroom, <laughs> except wrong. That's the wrong answer. That's what everyone always says. But the truth is, I bet even before you go to the bathroom, you'll look at the clock. The first thing most people do when they wake up is they look at the clock. What do you have to do to look at the clock? You have to take yourself from what we call transitional sleep, stage one sleep, where you're not fully asleep, but you're not fully awake yet either. You have to take yourself from that transitional sleep to full awakening, maybe pick up your head, maybe turn it to be able to look at your clock, or these days it's your cell phone, to see that it's 1.20 in the morning and you want to be asleep. What you've now done by taking yourself to full awakening is you've made it harder to go back to sleep. Remember our homeostat? You have to be awake a certain amount of time before you're gonna be sleepy enough to go back to sleep. So the best thing to do is when you first wake up at night, don't even open your eyes, just sort of turn over, get comfortable again and see if you can fall right back to sleep. Now you're gonna tell me, but I have to go to the bathroom. Sometimes you might fall back to sleep and not need to get up. But if you find there is that pressure and you do need to get up, then of course you need to do that. But you want to try to do it without turning on too many lights. I don't want you falling in the dark, maybe have a, a red night light or some other um, way to find your way safely. But you don't want to turn on too many lights because of, of course that again is telling your brain to stop secreting melatonin. I think these slippers are brilliant. I, this was an ad I saw in some magazine on an airplane many years ago. I wish I had ordered them. Um, but I think everyone should have these because then you can see where you're going at night without turning on any lights. So the clock, by the way, has no place in the bedroom. You don't need to know what time it is in the middle of the night. So if you have a clock, turn it around, get rid of it. If you're worried about needing to hear your phone or an alarm, stick it in a drawer or under the bed where you're not tempted to look at it because it's too hard not to look at it if it's right there. And the last thing you want to do is look at the time during the night. Other sleep hygiene rules, setting aside a worry time. You know, in our busy lives, um, the first moment we often have to sit and think is when we get into bed at night. And that's the wrong time to start worrying about things. So we suggest 
finding 10, 15 minutes during the day, not close to bedtime, when you can turn off your phone, you put out a do not disturb sign, and you sit and you worry. That's your time to think about all those things that you tend to think about at night. And if you do that at the same time every day, it starts freeing you from having to do it at night. This is a very effective technique for many people. I already mentioned many times the importance of light. It's really important to have good light exposure. Most of us spend way too much time indoors. We live in beautiful, sunny San Diego. Get outside and get your light exposure. And that will help your circadian rhythms be more stable and stronger. If you're going to nap, limit your nap to 30 minutes early in the afternoon. You know that feeling of uh, when you take a nap and you wake up and you feel worse than you did before you took your nap? That's because you're sleeping too long and you're going through some of the deeper stages of sleep. So limit your nap to 30 minutes um, and that will, you'll wake up feeling more refreshed. But if you have difficulty falling asleep at night, then avoid the naps. Because again, that's going to interfere with your homeostat with that need for sleep building. Up. And I already talked about uh, getting rid of the clock. So let me take a couple minutes to talk about other treatments for, for particularly insomnia. And the most obvious one, of course, is medications. I want to start with talking about diphenhydramine um, and other antihistamines. A diphenhydramine is what you found, find in all the PM drugs, like right? Tylenol PM, Advil PM, blah, 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 PM. Uh, the advantage is you don't need a prescription. It's available over the counter. It's cheap. And people think it's because you can buy it over the counter without a prescription. It's safe. But in fact, it is not recommended in us older adults. First of all, the hypnotic dose is not well defined. There's often tolerance. But even worse, there's um, grogginess and and. Uh, it being over sedated even in the morning when you wake up. It results in dried mouth, blurred vision. It can result in urinary retention, uh, dizziness, in, in coordination. Um, and it's even been shown to cause delirium. So I cannot tell you how strongly I feel about the older adult never, ever, ever using diphenhydramine as a sleeping aid. As I said, the behavioral treatments are the best treatment we have. Sometimes a pill is appropriate, but diphenhydramine is not that pill. The, the risks totally outweigh the benefits. And it's not just me that says this. This is our field that has made this uh, conclusion. So what your options are out there are those drugs that have been approved by the FDA specifically for insomnia. And most doctors have one drug in their back pocket that they like giving everybody, and that's the wrong approach to treating insomnia. You should be asking, or your doctor should be asking you two questions. The first question is, what problem are you having? Is it a problem falling asleep, staying asleep, or both? Because as you can see here, some drugs are approved for helping you fall asleep, some drugs are approved for helping you stay asleep, and then some are both. And the other very important question is how many hours can you devote to being in bed after you take that medication? Because you can see for most of these, you have to be in bed seven to eight hours if you don't want to have that morning sedation, that the morning side effects when you wake up. So if you can't be in bed at least seven hours, there are quite a few drugs here you should not be taking. There are a few that are approved for a shorter time period. Intermezzo is the only one that's approved for being for taking in the middle of the night. But I have to tell you that there are these new, three new drugs that are a whole new mechanism. Most of these are called benzodiazepines. Uh, this one is a melatonin receptor agonist. Silenor, uh, doxepin is actually an antidepressant and it was found that when used in very, very low doses, it's good for helping you stay asleep. Um, and doxepin is generic, so it, it's quite inexpensive. But these three new drugs are a whole new uh, mechanism, and they seem to be much safer, according to all the new data, than the older drugs. So if you are, you feel you do need a sleeping pill, I would talk to your doctor about one of these newer drugs. They're called orexin antagonists, and um, they might be a better way to go and they are all approved in older adults as well as in younger adults. 
Um, so these are data that uh, just recently published, in fact, just about within the last month, about how the use of medications is changing. There have been lots of recent initiatives to discourage uh, too many prescriptions being given out for sleep medications because of the um, awareness of the potential adverse effects, which is mostly about those benzodiazepines, those older drugs. Recent national trends in the use of medications for sleep um, were assessed in um, close to 30,000 people in the National Health and Nutrition Exam Survey. And what we found here is the odds of using medications for sleep disorders decreased by 31% between 2013 and 2018, which is very interesting. And this trend was driven by a decline in FDA approved medications um, for sleep disorders. And among older adults, those old, old, as we sometimes call them, 80 and above, I don't know why we call them that, but there was an 85% decline in use of these medications, which I think is really good news. So um, this suggests that there's a possible shift in the way sleep disturbances are treated. I hope these people are not getting not treated at all. I hope they're being treated with behavioral methods. Um, and, and the bottom line is there are options to medications. This is just a plot showing this is any medication. This is off-label use. A trazodone, for example, is not approved by the FDA for sleep, but it's probably used more than any other medication for sleep. It's an antidepressant that happens to be sedating, and that's why it's used most commonly. And then these are the um, FDA approved. And you can see, especially in these, the decrease in, in use. All right, so let me summarize that, and I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. It is not aging per se that results in poor sleep, but it's all the other things that happen to us as we get older that make it harder for us to get the sleep that we need. And it's not the need for sleep that changes, it's that ability to get that sleep um, that changes. Poor sleep in the older adult is most often associated with medical psychiatric illnesses, polypharmacy, changes in our circadian rhythms, and the higher prevalence of primary sleep disorders. And no matter the age of the patient, sleep disorders should be treated if they're interfering with quality of life or if there's a medical risk associated with it. And I always like to end with this quote, aging seems to be the only available way to live a long life. And so I wish you all Lots of good aging, us uh, along with lots of good sleep. Thank you. So now we'll have our question period, and I would encourage you to use the raise hand function on Zoom. Uh, for that, it's now I see at the right at the bottom of my screen, but I think usually it's at for people at the there's a response button you have to push and then you'll, if you click that, you will see uh, a choice to do raise hand, like Nellie has already raised her hand. And what happens is that the computer will notice who has raised hands and put you in line by the order that you've done it to the millisecond. So we already have four people online here. The first one is Nellie, the next is Martha, then shares and then Willard. Uh, the, as the person before you is talking, you please unmute yourself. So the first person is Nellie. What is your question, Nellie? This is Jean, Nellie's husband. She's driving. And she uh -huh. asked me to put this question. Would you comment on the safety and efficacy of melatonin and valerian as sleep aids? Sure, That's, those are great, very important and great questions. So let me start with melatonin. Melatonin is safe. Um, there are very few studies to suggest that there's any harm associated with melatonin, but the studies are also not that clear in terms of how effective they are. Many studies show that uh, melatonin is actually not a great sleeping aid. It's very good for shifting rhythms, but not necessarily for um, helping you fall asleep. Having said that, if you're using melatonin and you find that it helps, then that's fine. You don't need to stop using it. 
But if you haven't started it yet, again, you're better off with some of the behavioral treatments. The key with melatonin is knowing what the right dose and the right timing is. And that's something we don't have the best answer for yet. Most people use between one and three milligrams um, as a sleep aid. Um, but again, we don't have definitive data on that. Valerian root, on the other hand, on the other hand, is not so safe. And uh, most studies that I've seen have not recommended it. It's not that effective and it does, it can have um, more serious side effects. So I do not recommend valerian. The next person okay. up is Martha. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so can you uh, put up that slide? Uh, the rules of your relationship to your bed. I've forgotten how, uh, that, that say, says don't go to bed too early, uh, don't stay in bed, if it, that particular slide. Yeah, that, my four rules, hold on. I mean, I can't quite see it, hold on. I got it. <laughs> Thank you. All right, that's got it. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna paste that up on my bed. All right. <laughs> yes, they're very Thanks. important rules. By the way, if if anyone else would like a copy of my slides, I'm happy to share a PDF with Alvin and, and Dorothy, and then they can share them with you. That would be and great. We, also, the the talk is being recorded and will be on the SDIS website. And if you aren't an SDIS member so that you don't know where the, our YouTube site is, then if you send an email to me at dorothylparker at gmail.com or else go to the uh, SDIS Ask, which is listed on our website, we'll, we'll send that link to you. Also, if friends want to see this, you can do the same thing. The next person up is Karen Beckus. Hi, Dr. Uncle. Hi, Dr. Uncoley. Um, hi. Hi. Question regarding the napping, the 25 to 30 minute nap. Uh -huh. Does that include the time that you say, okay, I'm getting in bed, I'm putting on my, my nightshades, and now I've got 30 minutes? So, so that so maybe you only sleep maybe 10 minutes or five minutes out of that oh, 30 minutes. How does it, how can you equate that for me? 30 minutes of sleep. So the okay. time it takes you to get into bed and get ready doesn't count. It's that actual amount of sleep. Should be so limited. we can use our assisted devices to say set a timer for 30 minutes Absolutely. or whatever. Absolutely. That's exactly what you should do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next person whose hand is up is uh, Willard. <coughs> uh, yes, what about uh, acetaminophen, uh, better known as Tylenol? Right, so you're talking about regular Tylenol, not Tylenol PN, is that correct? Well, I've got a bottle in front of me, uh, yeah, regular. Yeah, so regular Tylenol is very good for pain, and pain often interferes with your sleep. So you may have some low grade pain that you're not even aware of and the Tylenol might be helping that. So if your doctor tells you it's okay for you to take Tylenol every night, I have no problem with you taking that to help your sleep. Thank you. Right, the next person up is Rick, A uh, Rich. Hi, actually it's his wife, Anna. Um, what can you say about too much sleep and excessive sleepiness that's constant? What do you do with that? You go and see your doctor because if you feel like you're sleeping a lot at night and you're still very sleepy during the day, there's something going on. Often while you think you're sleeping a lot at night and getting a full night's sleep, your sleep might be quite disrupted and you're not aware of it. Like for example, if you have sleep apnea, you might not realize that you're waking up multiple times during the night. Having excessive sleepiness during the day 
is usually, not always, but usually caused by one of two things. You're either taking a sedating medication that's making you sleepy, or you're not getting enough sleep at night. And that not getting enough sleep at night is either because you're not in bed long enough or something is disrupting your sleep during the night. So if you have excessive daytime sleepiness, I highly recommend you talk to your doctor about that and get evaluated for what's causing that and then get treated. Thank you. You're welcome. The next person up is Pete. Yes, hi. Uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, taking melatonin. I just wanna let you all uh, be aware of in this book, which is the, one of the most incredible books out there, uh, if you have any kind of blood disorder, lymphomas and things like that, he suggests, and other docs say the same thing, that probably melatonin is not a good uh, <clears throat> substance to use. However, melatonin in many other cancers is quite beneficial, and you can find that easily on the internet. So I uh, just want to let you know that if you have some lymphomas or things like that, blood disorders, you might want to check into... Uh, with whatever practitioner you're going to, whether or not melatonin may be a good answer. Also, the for the fellow that's uh, taking a lot of acetaminophen, I'd be really careful with that. Uh, you might want to also uh, take N-acetylcysteine, which is what is used in hospitals and elsewhere when people are uh, OD on the acetaminophen. It really is toxic stuff. So uh, NAC, also called N-acetylcysteine, is one thing that will help protect the liver from that uh, substance. That's about all uh, yeah, Thanks. so as I said, I mean, I would always talk to your doctor. Um, melatonin the problem is doctors don't know anything about uh, holistic and naturopathic medicine. That's, so if you're talking about a doctor, just your typical MD, unfortunately, they don't even know, they don't know hardly anything about <laughs> this area. Okay? That's what you could ask her. What, and what kind of cannabis? That's more important. Am I up? Yes, Pete, you're up. Uh, my wife is uh, an 80-year-old, very healthy woman who works out in the gym three, four days a week, takes no prescription medication, goes to bed every night at midnight and watches Amanpour while she sets the television on the sleep mode for an hour. She has not had a decent night's sleep in, I'm sure, 30 or 40 years. She cannot fall asleep and she cannot stay asleep. And she uses Z uh, Xanax now and then to help her. It marginally helps her. And it's been recommended now to her that she try cannabis gummies to try to, to help her sleep. But she is a chronic without sleep. And I'd like to know if you have any kind of a remedy for her. My problem is exactly the opposite. I'm a very, very good sleeper. I'm forced to go to sleep at midnight. I'd like to go to sleep at 11, but she won't let me. And, um, but I, during the day, I will fall asleep when I'm uh, watching television or doing something that I find boring. I will fall asleep or I will take a nap for a half an hour. All right, really let me, yeah, let me take those two separately. So let's start with your wife. Um, I, I would recommend, I, I, obviously I'm not gonna treat anyone over Zoom, but I would recommend that she go see a sleep specialist because there are many things they can do to help her sleep, particularly uh, behavioral treatments like cognitive behavioral treatment for insomnia would be very beneficial for her. In terms of CBD, I know that's become very, very popular. I'm a scientist, you know, I, I, it's like, show me the data. And the data are just not there yet for CBD. There are many studies going on. We don't have the answers yet for whether it actually helps sleep or not. So my recommendation to you is go see a sleep doctor. Your, your primary care can uh, refer you or you can just call your local sleep clinic, uh, wherever you get your health care and make an appointment to see someone because they can help you begin to sleep again. Now for you, uh, Pete, you have the opposite problem. Um, you've got what we would call some excessive daytime sleepiness. And again, as I said to the person who asked the question previously, 
you also need to go see a sleep doctor because needing a, a fall, it's not a boring situation that puts you to sleep. You only fall asleep in boring situations if you're already sleepy and that boredom or the dark room or the warm room unmasks your sleepiness. So you are sleepy at times when perhaps you shouldn't be, which as I said before, means there's probably something going on during the night disrupting your sleep. So I would recommend you both. You can go together, Um, go see (laughs) a local sleep doctor and, and get help for both your problems. Are you using the term CBD as a synonym for cannabis? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and they're different. There's CBD, there's THC, they're different kinds, but yes, for cannabis. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. Uh, the next person up is uh, Mike Seidel. Oh. You're on, you're on, Mike. Yeah, it keeps going back to mute. Try again. You're still muted, Mike. You, you had unmuted yourself, Mike. There. Oh, okay. Uh, well, years ago, I used to travel to Japan on business, and uh, it was always terrible. I used to take a... a a, a, a sedative uh, to, to sleep when I wasn't sleepy at all. And I woke up in the morning and it was just, ter- just terrible. And, and especially bad because I had the next morning, I had the business meetings. And, uh, but there was one time when I was on private, privately in, in Japan with, with friends of mine, and they, they gave me a breakfast at seven o'clock in the morning and, and said, uh, don't worry about it. We will we'll be back about 10 o'clock. You take your time. So I ate the breakfast and the sun was shining in my face all the time. I looked east uh, and, um, and I, for the whole week, starting that morning and the whole week thereafter, I felt like I was, I was perfectly awake at the right time and sleepy at the right time as well. Is, is that, is that uh, am I making this up? Absolutely not. Remember I said light is the strongest cue that our body has. And, and we use light with jet lag. Um, there are actually apps you can download on your phone that tell you when you're traveling to different time zones, when you should get your light exposure and when you need darkness to help shift your rhythms. But you're absolutely right. Light, especially morning light, is often the best thing we can do for our rhythms. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're a good scientist. You figured that out. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next person up is Rich or his wife. Hi, I, this is Anna again. Um, can uh, many um, healthcare programs do not have a good sensitivity to aging populations? Uh, Kaiser doesn't have a gerontology department. Can you provide me with a very short script about the kind of questions I want to ask a provider so that they are taking into consideration the very things that you brought up um, that I think are, are really essential for a provider to think about and my experience has been that they don't necessarily connect those dots. So, yeah, the what, bigger problem I think is that they know so little about sleep, and they don't like dealing with sleep. It scares them because they don't know what to do about it, and and they're gotten to the point as we can see where they don't really want to um, uh, prescribe long term use of sleeping pills. I think what you need to do is make an appointment with your doctor specifically to focus about your sleep. You know, uh, doctors are given 10 minutes or 12 minutes to see every patient and they have to deal with your cardiovascular problems and your hypertension and everything else that's that's perhaps, I don't know that it's more serious, they see it as being more serious and they don't have even the time to talk about your sleep. So make a separate appointment to just focus on your sleep. 
and make a list before you go in of all your questions and all your symptoms and, and all your concerns that you have about your sleep. And if you don't get satisfactory answers, which you may not, have them refer you to someone who specializes in sleep. There are sleep people at Kaiser who could see you. And they understand sleep transcends age. So they understand what sleep problems are. They understand what to do about them, no matter what your age is. Thank you. You're welcome. The next person up is H.J. Walker. Hello, thank you for a wonderful, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm, uh, I've always been an owl. I've never made the transition from college life to any other lifestyle. I'm just wondering if I could make a transition to the siesta lifestyle and have, uh, like you said, uh, the siesta societies don't seem to have any problems with any health issues and the life expectancy of these societies are about the same as ours. So, yeah, so I, don't know if, I don't know if I would say that necessarily, but okay. um, the question I would ask you is why do you feel you need to change from being an owl? I, I'm assuming given the group that I'm speaking to here that you're probably retired Yes. You don't have to get up at any special time during the day. So if you like your owl lifestyle, you don't have to change it. Okay. But if you want to be getting up earlier, I had a quick anecdote. I had a patient, an older gentleman who was an owl. He had been a math teacher, a professor. And he always had the hardest time making it to morning classes to teach. And now he was finally retired and it didn't matter. And he moved into a senior community where all the activities were early in the morning because everybody got up early. And for the first time in his life, he wanted to shift so that he can get up for, to be in the activities with the people around him. So if you really want to shift, it's that morning light. When your body is first waking up, go outside, no sunglasses, get about 30 minutes of that light exposure. And that may help you. Um, I, I don't know, and we don't have time to go into your personal story, so I don't know what time right. you're actually falling asleep. If you're falling asleep at two, it's not going to move you to 10, but it right. might move you to one or a little bit earlier than. Okay. So morning light is the best. And as I said, very low dose melatonin, like around 0.5 milligrams, about four to six hours before you go to sleep. So we're not using it to help you get sleepy. We're using it to shift your rhythms. Right. Thank you very much. I have no inclinations to do it. I just, it sounded like what you were recommending is that I should do it. Not at all. Not, not for everybody. Okay. Now, if it works for you and you're a natural owl, just go with it. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, Jean. How nice to see you. <laughs> you're nice to see you. one of only two familiar faces for me here. <laughs> It's lovely to see you and thank you for your presentation. I always learn some new things from you and being updated too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a more general question and, and it's about um, uh, the impact of people who've had COVID um, on, on sleep. And I was unfortunate to have it this summer. And um, I'm one of these people now. A lot of people have this now that I'm incredibly tired during the day, this extreme fatigue. And, um, and I'm not asking for myself because my primary care and, um, <laughs> and others say, I just have to get through this. Um, but just do you have, um, just anecdotally or from your professional uh, work, um, how do, what might be able to do to address this? And, and so is it to address your fatigue? What, what exactly is it you want to address? Well, no, I'm just wondering, I, I'm just wondering, uh, having had COVID now, I have sleep apnea, as you know, and um, which has been under control beautifully. Thank you very much. Um, but now having COVID, I'm now, you know, two months past it, and I'm still incredibly, and I get, yeah. and I get very sleepy in the afternoon, and which has not happened for, right. You know, yeah. There's no question that COVID plays havoc with people's sleep. Mm -hmm. um, there is the fit, that fatigue um, and with long COVID or even just as you take the time to get over all the symptoms, this is not at all uncommon. I would say, and in general, this is good advice for anybody, is listen to your body. Mm -hmm. If you are feeling sleepy, if you're feeling tired and you know you're recovering, rest, take a nap, try to sleep. 
If you find that it's interfering with your sleep at night, try to do it a little earlier. Don't nap as long. But, but the bottom line is listen to your body and get as much rest as you can because that's really what you need to help heal from COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Really good to see you, Jean. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think uh, I'm going to look through the chats fast and see if there's anything that should be uh, addressed here. Uh, yeah, there have been some, uh, Valerian, we talked about, there's some questions about lorazepam. Yeah, so, you know, lorazepam, uh, also an antidepressant. I, these are all drugs like the trazodone that are used off label. They're not recommended for sleep. There are many doctors that do use them because they can be sedating. Some of them are anxiolytic. They help uh, with anxiety. And, and perhaps if someone is anxious, then that might help them calm down and sleep. Not my favorite approach for treating sleep problems. Again, I think, you know, you, you've heard the expression, I'm sure you can teach a man to fish or you can give him a fish. I can give you a fish. I can give you a sleeping pill. Or I can teach you how to fish. I can teach you how to sleep again. And the behavioral treatments teach you how to sleep. And you're much better off if you can find someone who can do that with you. You're much better off when that, with that than any of the medications. I see after dinner walk considered exercise. Absolutely. A walk any time of the day is considered great exercise. It doesn't even have to be a brisk, fast walk. And if you're doing it after dinner, do it without sunglasses and get that light exposure, which for, as an older adult will help your sleep. That was because of the six hours you mentioned. Oh, I see. Yeah. You know, six hours is the ideal world, but we don't live in an ideal world. So get it whenever you can. And if you need that evening light, then taking an after dinner walk is perfect. Thank you. I have one little question and then maybe that gives people, if anyone has any more questions to think about it, otherwise I think we should uh, thank our speaker. But I'm a little bit confused about naps now. And this is partially, and this may be misinformation, but I think I've read somewhere that before electric lights, in the literature, one would see mentions of people of uh, the first sleep and the second sleep with a little phase in between the two of them. Right. And so I'm, I have a question about, I guess, two phases of sleep in various combinations. You know, so it, it seems, I haven't studied that. I've read the same literature that, that's out there. And most of the literature suggests that that's fine. I think it's how much sleep you're getting in total. Um, which should be seven to eight hours. So if you want to take a half hour nap or an hour nap in the afternoon and then sleep, you know, seven hours at night, so you're still getting your full eight, that's probably just fine. The, the issue with naps is if you want to try to go to sleep at a certain time at night and that nap is interfering with you going to sleep at that hour, that's when naps should be avoided. But if you're taking a short nap in the afternoon and you're getting the equivalent of a full night within your 24 hours, that's probably just fine. I hope that clarified it for you. Yes, it did very much. And I, I would yeah. like to thank I you just, so much for this talk. Right, I, and I just, okay. I feel the same way, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, but let me, if I can just ask one question. Sure. And that is, I, I got the impression that the amount of sleep that people need has some genetic aspect to it. And is there a way of knowing genetically that indeed some people would be perfectly fine with five to six hours of sleep a night as opposed to seven, while some may need a lot more? Yeah. Is that something in the bag? Uh, you're absolutely right, Alvin. There are individual differences. There are short sleepers. There are long sleepers. It's much more rare than people think. Many people say, oh, I'm a short sleeper. I only need five hours. But if you study them or if you watch them, you find they've got these micro sleeps during the day. They are tired. They are falling asleep watching TV because, you know, and they, they blame it like earlier because it's boring or in a lecture. Oh, it was a boring lecture. That's why I fell asleep. Of course, not my lecture. My lecture is never boring. But, um, <laughs> but no, it, it's not that. It's how you're sleeping at night. So, um, yeah, th that's really the bottom line. Okay, in that case, 
Why don't we thank our speaker, Dr. Ankali Israel, one more time. You can all applaud if you're muted. You can still applaud. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you. It.